Hi everyone, welcome. Just letting people filter in right now. Um, since we are limited on time this hour, uh, let's go ahead and maybe I'll I'll kick it off with the agenda real briefly, and um, then we'll go with uh, maybe Dr. Tamsin last. So, <laughs> so many people filtering. I have to keep clicking the button. Um, this meeting is being recorded. We're going to post it to YouTube afterwards for everyone's access, um, just because some people could make it. Um, and also, I just honestly I think what Dr. Tampson has to share is really cool, and everyone should know more. Um, so again, welcome to the next San Diego Virtual Coffee. This is something that we do every other Thursday. Um, and if you're not familiar with what Next San Diego is, basically we are a web-based community of regenerative entrepreneurs. Uh, with the purpose of connecting people for the common good. And our focus is on the San Diego bioregion, but also beyond that, because we understand that we are a living system ourselves um, and not a contained ecosystem. So um, basically, we're just really passionate about helping people connect who are trying to use business as a force for good, whether they are an entrepreneur themselves um, or just want to support businesses that are doing that. And also just learning like what is regenerative and you know, what are the different things going on in our community and how can we support each other rather than trying to figure it out in our own little silos. Um, and so this is something that we kind of saw there was a need for last year when the pandemic hit and we weren't really finding that. So we created Nick San Diego. Um, if for any reason this already exists, please let us know so we can stop and just join the other group. I would love that so much. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today. Um, wanted to just mention, let's see, so I, I don't think we have any other special events coming up. This one's kind of a, a really good treat today, um, but we do have more virtual coffees every other Thursday. Um, check out our website and join our Slack community for more to connect with other people. Um, and that's, that's going to be it for Nick San Diego announcements. Um, what I would like to do, since we have such a large group, um, is maybe do really brief introductions around so we can just kind of get to know everyone in the room because that's kind of the intention of the coffees um, to be a little bit more of a casual environment and not too formal. Um, so maybe I'll kick it off very briefly. I'm Isabel Wen, I'm one of the founders of Nick San Diego. I'm located here in San Diego um, or Kunlie land and uh, I kind of do a little bit of everything. My background has been in all kinds of STEM, nanotech, biotech, um, chemistry, and more recently, I've been trying to do a deeper dive into business for good and trying to figure out my place there. Um, I'm a consultant, and maybe something a little bit more fun about me is, I don't remember if I use this already, but I can teach cats tricks. I've taught a couple of different cats. Um, so. Yeah, a <laughs> cat wrangler, cat whisperer. Um, maybe just to, for, for sake of time, I'm going to call on people to make it a little bit faster. Um, and remember to, to keep it brief. We've got, I think, 20 people RSVP today so, and, and more filtering in every minute. So um, how about Beelin? Would you like to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Blen. I am based in Los Angeles. I work in the nonprofit sector. Um, I actually connected with Isabel because we're in the same cohort of the Next Economy MBA. Uh, very much interested in, uh, you know, regenerative businesses and cultures and the whole paradigm shift uh, from the business as usual model. And I've been super interested in uh, systemic and living design and also taking a course with the Fritch of um, Capra, the Capra course. So this is something that I'm very interested in and really looking forward to uh, uh, the talk. So thank you. Thanks, Belen. Sorry, I, I butchered your name. Belen, 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 Belen. Okay, I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> thank you. Kelly. Hey, I'm Kelly O'Hara and I own Sustainable CFO, although I just uh, found out that someone has a pending trademark on that name, so I need to find a new name. So um, anyways, I provide back office support, contract CFO, um, and helping businesses align their, their uh, purpose and their finances. So 
And then something interesting, I think, is what we're doing. I'm um, actually next week going to a spiritual, vegan, plastic-free community in Costa Rica for two weeks to have some R and R in the jungle, and I can't wait. It's called Pachamama, and I I'm so excited. <laughs> I love that. That sounds so relaxing. And um, Hobson. Yeah, so um, Hobson Lang, Tangible AI, we are a for-profit co company that serves nonprofits um, and social impact organizations. Uh, projects like chatbots in Nepal to educate uh, teenagers, um, business owner educate uh, business owners in Myanmar, which is quite challenging at the, at the moment, and um, educating high school students in the U.S. That's me. Thanks, Hobson. Hobson's also on the committee for Next San Diego, which is awesome. Um, Zach. Hey, friends. Uh, I'm Zach Rodenbarger in Indianapolis, Indiana. Had connected through a friend of a friend of Isabel's and um, as our company, we created software to help employees and their companies give back. So whether volunteering or donating, uh, we really wanted to help employees have a voice uh, in, in their company's giving and encourage all of them to take their volunteer time off, uh, complete their matching donations and things like that. For more for the SMB market than the um, 10,000 company, 10,000 employee size companies, more for you know 100 to 200 people. Um, and I guess a, a quick little fact: I, I love kayaking and led um, like 10 to 14 day kayak trips with high schoolers uh, for a previous job. Cool. How fun, Brooke. Um, you have to excuse the dog playing in the back, back. so uh, he's just like pushing around a toy right now so that I can do this. Um, I'm Brooke. I'm based just outside of Boston, and I'm an emerging environmental gerontologist. Um, I came across this on LinkedIn, and I'm excited to be here. You're going to have to explain what that is to me in the chat. <laughs> I want to learn. Um, Brandon. Hey, Isabel. Good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, I'm Brandon Wolner. I'm in San Diego uh, with Isabel. And I am, uh, I work in bioprocessing, uh, upstream bioprocessing, basically anything that involves growing a cell line or an organism to either make a product or as the product itself. Uh, that's where my expertise is. Been doing this for over 20 years. I've been in drug discovery and development. I've been in biofuels. I worked at Dow Agrosciences in Indianapolis. Zach, hey, call out to Indianapolis. Uh, I also used to work in Massachusetts uh, for several years. So uh, I got two home, home people on this call. Um, right now I'm getting really into food tech. I'm really excited about food tech. Um, I've been, most of what I've done has been in, uh, driving towards sustainability and renewability. And so if I look at the food tech industry right now, replacing uh, um, animal agriculture and uh, creating these interesting vegan alternatives to animal foods um, that are more sustainable and mm, maybe healthier. Not so sure about that part, but <laughs> we'll get there sooner or later. Thanks, Brandon. Leo? Yes, hi, I'm Leo Hippies. I work here in San Diego. Uh, as quality engineer manager in software testing and software companies. And Hobson told me about this particular meeting, so I'm here to listen in. That's great. I love the, the introductions. It seems to be how the community is growing. Hung? Hey, I'm Hung. I I'm, I'm from San Diego. I'm a recent graduate from UCSD in June 20, at major in speculative design and minor entrepreneurship. I heard about Next San Diego around October when I kind of checked out uh, the Startup San Diego channel and I saw Isabel posted a, regenerative, a group that focused on regenerative and I got cu curious. A fun fact, I just recently finished a design course on system thinking by Design for Impact. It's it pretty much incorporate, uh, just think about 
the system as a tangible feedback system with leverage point that you can adjust and and yeah. Very cool. Thanks, Han. Kitika. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Kitika. I'm joining from uh, San Diego. Uh, as regards my background, it's uh, been in like you know business research and analysis, working with corporates and freelancing. But uh, like now, like you know, I seek to transition to working with uh, like you know organizations and businesses who are doing some like you know meaningful work and uh, to like you know mission driven organizations. And I felt like you know next uh, San Diego is a great opportunity to connect with people and like just learn like you know what's happening around what people are doing. That's it. <laughs> Megan. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm in San Diego. I work in exhibitions at the New Children's Museum. So for those of you who are in San Diego, you might know us. Um, and uh, I know Isabella and Bielan from the um, NBA program we're in looking at regenerative economies. So I'm just curious about ways of, of bringing my current institution and future institutions into better ways of being a nonprofit in our community. Love that. Erin? Hi, everybody. Erin Miller. Um, I've known Isabel for a few years now through uh, Women in Bio and actually happened to be reading uh, Tamsin's book, Teaming, uh, for uh, the last few months. And so I was so excited to see that you brought her on. Um, I am a research and development project lead with Seed Health, where we make microbial applications for human and planetary health. And I run our Seed Labs division, where we make um, environmental probiotics for bees, corals, and other areas where microbes can have a great impact. Thank you. Love that. How did you find out about our book? actually through your last event with Orion, uh, they mentioned something about it. And I said, that sounds amazing. We, we talk a lot about superorganisms at SEED and so, uh, so, so excited to see how we can keep implementing those principles throughout. Very cool. Thanks for joining us, Erin. Um, Krista. Hi, everybody. I'm Krista and I am uh, Tamsin's executive assistant at Team Innovation. I am also the creative strategy person for Bonobo Revolution, which is um, Dr. Tamsin's initiative to advance our collective intelligence through advancing gender equality as the number one leverage point for change. Because um, we know that elevating girls in education and leadership actually um, makes all everything advance quicker and that's our fastest way um, for catalyzing change. So that's me. Nice to meet everybody. I'm so sorry my video is off, but I I, uh, I wouldn't be able to speak to you all if it was on, so. All good. Nice Technology. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making sure I didn't miss anyone, right? I think, I think everyone's accounted for. Um, all right, so. Dr. Tamsin, would you like to take it away, maybe introduce yourself as well? Sure, um, I'm Dr. Tamsin. Hi, nice to meet you all. Thank you all for coming, very cool. Um, in a wide range, not everybody's from San Diego, that's really cool. Um, so I'm an evolutionary biologist, uh, biological anthropologist. Um, I study social systems. And now I apply those um, biological learning on social evolution to corporations and organizations uh, on a variety of levels of the spectrum to try to get us to switch from mechanistic thinking and design to living systems thinking and design so that we can you know, adapt quickly um, and be more effective in growing future possibilities. So I've, uh, let's see, I, I got my PhD in 99. And then I came to San Diego, ended up uh, working in uh, biotech as a, a genetic engineer of all things. Um, and I'm glad I did because I saw all the dysfunctions of a team and an organization and, and all those things um, that are not aligned with our, our human nature or the nature of living systems. So that was really um, 
informative to me. And I ended up being an entrepreneur from that. So I ended up running my, um, my now ex-husband's business, photography business for 12 years. And I really got hooked on being an entrepreneur. Um, I, I can't imagine going back to corporate life. Um, so I, in the process of that, I um, ended up, uh, I sold my business. You know, I ended up um, really wanting to get back to my biological roots and, and my evolutionary thinking. So I um, wrote a book called Teaming, which Aaron was reading. And it's really just about how would you apply that living systems thinking towards the way that we do everything. So designing organizations, how do you, you know, bees and uh, honeybees and ants design companies? Um, you know, they've been doing the same kinds of complex things that we've been trying to do for like quarter of a, a billion years in the case of um, termites or ants have been doing it for 125 million years. So they've worked this stuff out. And here we are trying to design companies that um, do complex things, but um, you can see that it's kind of a mess. So it's informative to look at these other creatures and see how that they do that. And, and then we can look at our own organizations and see, thank you. Um, so what I did, I, I wrote that book that was in, I wrote it in 2015. It came out in 2017. And then um, I was actually uh, working in the field of biomimicry, um, of innovation inspired by nature. Uh, but what I found was that a lot of these companies, we, you know, they get super excited about the ideas, but they were not structured for adaptability, for new ideas. Um, it was very difficult for them to integrate a new idea and to act upon it in any kind of rapid way. So I was, I noticed that and being a social evolution biologist, you know, working with baboons and Ethiopia and all these different species, I, I couldn't help but see that it was the structures and processes that were stopping us from doing what we're naturally good at doing. So it seemed to me that there really wasn't a problem. It was just that we're structured wrong. Um, so that's what I've been setting out to do, working with companies first um, on teaming. But now I'm, I've diversified because I, uh, I'm now the, bio, the Dean of Biocultural Leadership at uh, Geoversity, which is in Panama. And it's a 501c3 that works on um, communities that are uh, conserving their biodiversity, cultural diversity and biological diversity. Um, but they're, they're giving them the, helping them grow the leadership capabilities for doing that. Um, because it's not so easy, you know, when you've got uh, communities that actually live in these areas, you know, they need to do it themselves. Um, so how, how do you structure around that? So I, I've been working as the Dean for Geoversity and now um, because of COVID, I can't get to Panama. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could do the same thing here? Um, so I found this incredible property in Anza Borrego, which is um, like two hours east of San Diego. And it's a 90 acre wilderness, just really amazing. So we're trying to um, just getting it off the ground, cultivating, it's all regenerative design um, framework um, work. We're gonna do living systems thinking immersions and lots of cool stuff. So I'll share with you about that. But so I thought what I would do is kind of take you through a quick um, slide deck and just introduce like kind of the range of ideas that I'm working on and then give you some provocations that you can use in your own business. And then we can just have a conversation um, and you can answer uh, you know, whatever's coming up for you and, and we can play with that. So does that sound good, Isabel? Sounds great. Okay, now you might have to ex excuse my Wi-Fi because I am at my wilderness ranch right now, which has wilderness Wi-Fi. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, well, so I just started with this because, uh, you know, this is my actual, the title of my new book that I'm working on now, which is The Total Teaming Transformation, because teaming um, is a pretty philosophical book, 
you know, I was really working out a lot of the ideas. And uh, of course, when you get entrepreneurs or executives coming to you, they, they don't want to know about the slime mold so much, generally. I know, weird. Uh, they want to know what to do. <laughs> so this book will be more like short, sweet, to the point, um, enough biology to go, oh yeah, I see how that pattern works, uh, but not enough to alienate people that have bug fear. <laughs> so, um, I, I started out, you know, I was obsessed with uh, Jane Goodall, and, and so I really wanted to be a biologist and a primatologist, and I just loved her approach of actually listening to the creatures and going to their world and not imposing, um, you know, it's not a zoo or a museum, and, and that actually has come back around now because the, the ranch is the Borrego Institute for Living Design, and so that's part of my, my uh, uh, interest now is, you know, that we we tend to fence people out of these biodiversity hotspots. But what if we actually taught them to do the work of maintaining them? Um, I mean, we now we know that the forests of the Amazon are, are gardens created by humans over thousands of years. So if you fence people out, you're going to lose the ability to maintain that. So that's um, been it, it, full circle for me. So I was just really interested in animals. I wanted to learn all about them. Um, but I was really interested in also understanding what kind of animal we are and why we've designed everything all wrong. Um, I was so upset as a young child just with the destruction of everything. So I ended up doing my doctorate in uh, Ethiopia and with these two different kinds of baboons and studying their social evolution. And it was a, it's a really cool natural experiment with uh, these two really different baboons interbreeding and then dispersing over this wide range. Um, and so you, it was a natural experiment, really cool. Uh, and I learned a lot about the social structures that um, allow populations to adapt very quickly because the one species was structured for collaboration and rapid evolution, and you could see that. And then the other um, was just the same as most baboons in, in Africa, not very different, not very unique, uh, and kind of a more generalist way of life. So I was really interested in what was it about their social structures that allowed this one species to change very quickly and adapt to its um, habitat. And then now, of course, I work with companies and I'm thinking, what kind of structures can we um, help them cultivate that allow them to adapt fast. So then getting into the superorganisms, you know, I just saw that, like, what kind of creature are we? I mean, yes, we're an ape, but our social system is so different. And we really are much more organized like um, a superorganism, like, you know, ants or honeybees. So I started looking at that, like, wh why are we, if that's what we are, then why have we designed um, our systems and structures in this other way? And, and can we align them so that we can live our nature and also do the things that we're intended to do in the world that we naturally want to do in the world? Um, and here I'm just showing that like how similar we are, like these complex structures that we're making. And, and yet you think about it and like, here's the ants, they're not in traffic or breathing smog and here we are. Um, so maybe they have something to teach us. And then if you play that, that, uh, that kind of formula, the structures that the ants and honeybees are using, if you were to play that forward, let's say 2 billion years, um, you might get something like a slime mold or a mycelial networks that are underground. So the mushrooms, you know, that's just the fruit on top, but they have these dense networks that look like our internet underneath. So we're really converging on that kind of structure because that's in our nature. So um, getting our minds around that and, and designing in alignment with that is, is, is what I got excited about doing. Um, and what's unique about it is like, these are not clones any more than we are. These are all diverse, independent individuals and they're networked around a shared purpose. And that's, what's, that's what gives them their flexibility. Um, and so that's important to bear in mind when we're designing our own superorganisms. Um, here we are, 2020, 21. Uh, wow, pivot, time, run. Um, so I think a lot of these, you know, whereas I would get 
some hesitation from big companies before because they were more conservative. Now I'm getting, um, we're desperate. What do you got? I'm like, hey, well, life's been doing this for 3.8 billion years. We got it. We got you covered. Um, so, and, and things could be worse. You know, every living creature has evolved for 3.8 billion years, one spark of life. And so we're all survivors, like all of us uh, had this unbroken stream of ancestors that survived. So it's the natural place to look for these answers. Darwin um, and, and biomimicry that these are the survivors. Uh, and, and just that these, you can see that the living, um, these living systems are designed by life to create conditions conducive to more life. And, um, and we're not doing that. We're not doing that currently. We're actually simplifying and removing diversity so that, and those are the future possibilities of what could be. So um, I think flipping our mind to this is important. You know, designing for future life. Um, and so biomimicry, I don't, you, you, probably most of you are familiar with it, but it's, it's innovation inspired by nature's proven successes. So what are these animals doing? Uh, how does it work? Can we study that and can we emulate it um, to get more efficiency, more uh, you know, life-friendly conditions? Um, Velcro is the classic example, but um, you know, that was just uh, designed from these burrs, these seed burrs that were in the man's dog fur. And he looked under the microscope and he thought, ah, we, I could invent something like this. So he did that. But of course, these are still plastic. Like this is, you can take this further. Like how would nature actually do this? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make it out of plastic. It would make it out of something edible. And, and so you can, there's no, um, you can always iterate these further and develop them uh, to become more life-friendly. Um, there's another example, Fortune loves biomimicry. I um, mean, this is just a column that I wrote for many years on, on this biomimicry and, um, and that turned into teaming. Uh, so these are some of the th ideas that came come out in this book. Um, as I said, it's pretty philosophical. So, but I identified these five main areas where um, I, I see the patterns that uh, superorganisms have and we're super organisms. So we have these patterns, but our organizations are designed to prevent us from using them. And the reason is because of this efficiency standardization scale up paradigm that we have, because when you scale up, you wanna remove the diversity, eliminate the noise, make it easy to scale. Um, but of course, when you do that, you remove all the diversity or suppress it and those are the future possibilities for adaptability. So you've cut off your legs. Um, you can make a lot of money really fast, but then you die. Um, so these are the kind of things that, um, that, that they do. I mean, and one is the collective intelligence and it's, that's what that bonobo revolution thing is, is getting towards um, because we, as super organisms, we pool our knowledge and abilities and we help each other and share. And, um, but you can't do that with our natural ape dominance tendencies because the big guy will just come in and take everything. Um, but humans, unlike the other apes, have uh, this way of suppressing dominance through culture. So we actually work to suppress it so that we can all speak and, and be heard. And that's required for our collective intelligence. So I think um, flipping the paradigm there, it's not about your own um, individual rights. I mean, it is, but it's, we all are invested in maintaining that for our collective intelligence. Um, so I think that's something that doesn't get said enough that the value of diversity is the future potential. Swarm creativity kind of plays on that, just like all our great ideas and all, I just feel like we have the answers, we have the abilities, it's the structures and processes that are preventing us from doing what we do best. So um, kind of an easy fix when you look at it that way, um, but I'm an optimistic person. 
distributed leadership is that thing that we do that suppresses dominance, that open space, holds space for us all, for our voices, so that we can get the collective intelligence we need. Um, and that's a complex thing. That's a whole thing. The, um, and then that regenerative value of just, and that's what you guys are, I think, are mostly in, of like regenerating the capabilities and the, the creating conditions conducive for more life. Um, so those are the main themes that come out of it. I uh, do a lot of immersions with lots of companies, um, do a lot of living systems immersions at the ranch and in um, geoversity. If you see that, like, you know, this is just suppressing the diversity that we need. Is this the essence of the problem? <laughs> like, so, um, so how do we do that? So I mean, you guys are all into living systems, so we don't have to go into that, but it's this efficiency versus resilience paradigm. You know, you've got to have that diversity. Otherwise you, you don't have the future possibilities. Um, and, and I often show people this evolutionary process because it's surprising how few people are, um, just because of the nature of our siloed lives, you know, scientists and artists do not mix and business people and biologists do not mix. So we don't have all that knowledge that we need to understand these things. So I often um, will just show this, like, like these animals and creatures and organization, organisms are not clones. They're very diverse and selection works on that. Um, and that's how evolution works. It's a shift in um, diverse possibilities. So you've got to have the diverse possibilities to even do it. Um, and then you get these radiations of amazing things, all these um, great businesses and ideas and cultures and languages and all this great stuff. That's the raw feedstock. Um, and then also thinking about li living systems are nested and linked. And so when you're planning your businesses, you know, you can be thinking about yourself and your offerings, but you have to also be thinking about your team and your clients. And then you have to be thinking about larger things, your industry and community and the impact you're having on the world and aligning all that so that you're taking care of yourself and your family and your team and your clients and the world. Um, and, and that's another thing, like we're so used to thinking in these linear systems. But, but really, once you start really thinking this way about your business, you'll find that the narratives fall into place, the marketing falls into place, decision making is easy. Um, I think this is a really critical place to begin. Uh, I was just going to um, throw this question out to you and kind of provoke you, and then we will open it up and see, um, have some Q&A and, and thoughts. So I want you to think like all of you have businesses and endeavors, projects. So imagine for a moment that everything you were planning worked perfectly, like five years from now. Um, everything you imagine is coming true. It's all working. And um, so you feeling that? Like just all your happy clients and your happy life and everything beautiful and the impact you're making on the world. Um, but then what's in the way of that? Why don't you have that? Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I think probably we're gonna hear a lot of, um, oh, it's the money or, uh, oh, if I, only I could, if only we could educate people, if only we could get them to understand this or things like that. Um, we tend to be kind of problem oriented on this, but um, the beauty of this re regenerative design and, and living systems thinking is that you, you transcend that um, to look at potential and who else is invested in accomplishing the things you're envisioning. And then suddenly it becomes like a snowball rolling downhill. Uh, you, you don't have to keep putting the effort into pushing it up the hill. So I think um, this is a really critical thing that feeds into those nested systems and can really give you clarity on your business. So I'll just open it up. Uh, any questions you wanna ask me about any of that or if you have thoughts about this, um, I'm here. 
could you go back one slide that, that slide before that seems like to be the, the, the crux of what organizations do wrong but need to do right? The one with the circles, the three circles. I'm trying to capture those those words. Oh no, there. System structures. Oh, there was there was one after that with the three oh, circles. Oh, the other way. Yeah, this one. Cool. Oh so yeah. You your offerings. Got it. Yeah. So focus yeah. on your your offerings. Focus on the product. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, but then you know what what we see is like we have all these best practices, you know. And so many of the time that it's the processes and structures and systems that are preventing us from doing what we would naturally do. So um, the problem becomes eliminating that so that we can just think bigger, think bigger than those, those constraints um, and not be so problem oriented. So that's just where I'm coming from with that. Um, these are some of the things I do. I actually took uh, all the Roche pharmaceutical leadership from Africa and Eastern Europe through the woods, uh, redwoods, and showed them how living systems work, how innovation and adaptability and resilience work. And um, they said it was transformative to their management style. So uh, it's interesting. Um, and here's some pictures of the ranch too. All right. Okay. I actually had one question. I'm sorry, I'm joining a little bit late. So apologies. Um, I missed the beginning of the presentation, but I was curious, what if the problem is not that there are processes in the way, but what if there aren't enough processes or what if you're building something new and aren't really sure how to create the right structure for it? Yeah. Well, so we use the regenerative design frameworks from, for that. Um, and it's, you know, you, I have like, uh, what are you trying to do in what way? And so that what could, you know, so you, it, you, you want to think from the nested system and the impact you want to have. Um, and, but before that, even you want to understand the essence of yourself and your business and your work and your um, customers. So I do a lot of essence work before I even get into that of just what are the like population flows that are involved in this. Um, but then like, what are we starting with? What's, what wants to be here? Because if you go, oh, well, uh, this would be great. It should be this way. And you come in and do it. Um, I find that you really have to start from what the community wants that you have to, you know, you can't regenerate a machine by with parts, you have to regenerate it from an embryo that's already there. So um, the more work you can spend understanding um, what's coming from yourself, like what are you really trying to express uniquely? And then who are your clients uniquely? Um, that tends to lead into that um, nested system that'll that'll clarify that. And, and I do have little prompts and things like that that take you through that process. Amazing, thank you so much. Yeah, I have a question, Dr. Tamson. Sure. What is an immersion? Oh, immersion is where you are immersed. <laughs> it's where, so I, you know, it's very hard to tell people, yes, everything is lit part of a living system, even your phone, even your computer. Um, I can do this living system work anywhere with anything, but it for the uninitiated, it's hard for them to see living systems um, in it with imposed simplicity. So I try to get them out into a complex thriving ecosystem where they can see the diversity and the relationships um, in a way that flips them out of their everyday mindset. So I call that immersion. I immerse them in um, a, a living system and, and then we can tease out those things and then we relate it to their business and what they're doing. Uh, yeah. That sounds wonderful. I could I could use an immersion right now. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty fun. Great way to shake up your mind and see a different, see things differently. 
Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> that it's, you know, we get so used to thinking the, with our, the problems that we have and the existing systems that we have, but like putting that biological um, lens, it, it, even if it's like in a metaphorical sense, can really give you insight um, that you didn't have. This is more of a maybe broad philosophical question, but I'm thinking about you in the desert and I'm thinking about Andrea Zatel and other you know, artists and thinkers who've gone out to the desert to kind of show different ways of being. And, and what was your attraction to Borrego? Why, why that place? Why that moment? Well, yeah, I spent a lot of time out here. Um, I mean, it's my happy place. So, and I've been camping here by myself for, I get two nights off, I'm here camping. So um, I just, I have a connection that way. Um, but then as a kid, my dad, he's an, he's an architect. Um, he would take me out to the desert to look at the geodesic domes that people made. You know, I'd take a picture of me with, for me for scale. <laughs> How you get in there for scale, um, but he, I ha, he, he just cultivated in me this idea that a desert was a place that was stark and clean, and you could see the bones of systems, and you could um, experiment. You could try different things. You could be eccentric. You could be authentic there, and without all these confusions that that get in the way, it just seemed very stark and pure way to back up and see see the reality of things yeah uh, uh i will ask about you it's kind of like a follow-up so uh i guess definitely see where your biomimicry background it um background is in so i was kind of curious about how do you how do you see uh so my question is more what what better uh how's uh, how's understand the desert ecosystem will benefit as for example uh like in china and some other country they're actually trying to start a green initiative to plant many trees you know to combat deserts taking over you know uh far, farmable lands and i was yeah. wondering and i was kind of wondering um i do understand there are some benefits on understanding the desert ecosystem as well, understanding, you know, Greenland ecosystem, but I don't really have too much understanding besides limited knowledge yeah. on the desert. Yes. Um, well, I mean, yes. So I, I actually work with Joel Glansberg, who's uh, a permaculture veteran, like on 40 years. Um, and he actually pioneered a lot of the greening the desert work. So we want to have um, him come out here with his um, people and start a permaculture that's um, based around native foods and uh, native plants here, um, but also water, man like how does nature wa manage water here? How does nature manage energy? Um, we have a lot of wind. How would nature ma manage wind? I mean, you can see like, okay, the animals are going underground during the day or they're changing, um, their altitude during the day, or they have patterns. There's patterns that emerge. Um, and so I definitely wanna bring that forth. And, and a big part of what my work is in um, biocultural renewal. So like getting, helping people start to see the patterns so they can design an alignment with them in that place. So, it, it, you know, we're, we have all this impetus to scale and be global, but really every, it, everything is diverse and unique. So how do you um, integrate those two requirements? So a lot of my work is around that. So how do you become more unique, but also integrate? Um, and so I think the, the desert's a nice way to do it. But the, the other thing is, you know, them, I'm at Geoversity, which is in Panama. And of course we like climate change, so that's the lungs of the planet, right? Like the biodiversity is there. Um, so it would seem intuitively like the work should be done there and we do the work there. But what I realize is that everything's connected and here you've got all these people in like LA and Southern California and 
um, places that are not tropical rainforests. And so what are we going to do, you know, and, and what is our contribution? But I think it's ultimately inspiring people to understand that they're part of the living world and to observe and notice the patterns all around you and start designing with them uniquely. Um, so I think that it's good to do the very diverse ecosystems like the desert and the rainforest and, you know, everybody should be doing this wherever they are at. Hi, um, I'm wondering about integration. So I've also done a number of um, immersive experiences and every single time they've been so transformative and like, you know, really earth rocking and, um, and, and just incredibly powerful. And then I come back to the US and I, yes. I get back into the city and I have to figure out how to bring these really amazing experiences into the world. And so I'm wondering, and I honestly, I've had a kind of a hard time figuring out how to integrate fluidly. And I've had a lot of conversations with others in these groups. And so I'm wondering if you can just like give some steps that you take uh, to help folks integrate back with all of the wonderful knowledge that they gain in your, in your experiences. Yeah, I think you're talking about permi depression. Um, <laughs> you go on these amazing things. I mean, I've been on so many biomimicry things and you're like, I can change the world. It's like, got this, some clarity. And then you get back home and you're like, everybody else is on another planet. Um, and you're like, come get on my boat. And they're like, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but so I do think that's really important um, and in two ways. So like I've got students that will come to Panama for programs or students that will come to Borrego for programs, but they have to go back to their homes. Um, and I want them to do the work in their homes. I want them to regenerate those habitats. Um, and even in the city, you know, you can be look, you can be seeing the weeds and the cracks and the, and the people and the even like I said, the phones and everything is part of the living system. So um, what I what I uh, come to is um, creating a membership where there's ongoing support um, and that is locally specific. So you start networking with people that are back in your home area and then you start, you know, so you have, you can keep going with your projects with a like-minded person that understands your local neighborhood. So I think that's really important. So we want to have um, like regenerative design support groups um, that are uh, just structurally part of the program. Um, the other thing is we do these creative residencies because I want to have diverse people coming through. So. You know, I, um, I want artists and I want uh, writers and I want sculptors and researchers and all kinds of people. Um, and so I think the membership is another way to see those things uh, cross-disciplinary, you know, because, the, you know, it, it just frustrates me that here we are and like, okay, you wanna be an MBA and do business. And so that's what you do, you do business, but where's the biology class? You know, you don't even know, like, like it's just too siloed. We can't get there from here. So um, I think that we have a lot of opportunities to, to seed that cross, um, cross discipline exchange, diverse exchange of all kinds. Uh, but yeah, anchoring to the local is really key. What are some of the situations, um, business specific and organization specific in which um, hierarchies and like a strong leadership is actually beneficial and opposed to areas where, you know, a, a collective kind of, um, you know, working all together and distribution of power is more beneficial? Yeah, I mean, in, in biological networks, you see both. It's not that hierarchies are bad, you know, um, we have cancerous cells arising in our bodies all the time. 
but we have a hierarchical system, the immune system that removes most of that. Um, and so that's a hierarchy that works. It keeps, if like, if, if it's working, don't break it or, yeah. <laughs> so the hierarchy is great for that. You know, um, it's great for safety. It's great for quality control. Um, but it, it, what it does too, though, is it removes diversity and noise and experimentation. So you've got to tune your system to the conditions you have. I mean, you might have uh, an industry with a really um, small margin where you can't afford, you know, you're canning tomatoes. You can't afford to dabble in inefficiencies. So, um, you know, you, you do have to tune it. But at the same time, it may be that the best way to do that is self-organized um, employees. If they're very clear on purpose, that might actually be better. Um, so yeah, but but it's not that one or the other is good or bad. It's just that there's a, each situation and needs to be tuned. I'm thinking of a which absolutely does. Yeah, I'm thinking of a pack of wolves where you you've got a hierarchy, um, but. Uh, that system works because of the survival of the fittest where there's there's a there's a dog eat dog world out there and um and so the strongest ends up being that alpha or ends up being that the the most altruistic ends up being the one that jumps on the back of the gazelle um because it's he's and he becomes the alpha how how can that work in an organization where you want to have support for those that are um less capable um, so that they can contribute to the organization while at the same time having that hierarchy and without survival of the fittest. Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting that those, those really hierarchical um, organizations in nature are, um, they do that to reduce competition. Um, so like they, they allow an individual to be dominant because they will waste energy or be injured or, you know, so, so they, they just go to something else. And that's actually a part of the process of diversica diversification. Um, but then when you look at human organizations, you know, we're not wolves and nor are we um, chimpanzees. You know, we actually work to suppress hierarchies generally, if we can. Um, and individuals generally work to have dominance if they can. But if you can't be the boss, you generally don't want anyone to be the boss of you. <laughs> so that, that somewhere in there is the essence of, of our kind of super organism. Um, so, um, you know, yes, you can have hierarchies, but to what degree are they suppressing diversity and future potential? Um, and to what degree are they making things more efficient? Um, and you just have to tune that. But I, I found that organizations way err on the side of efficiency and eliminating diversity and possibility. Do you, do you have some examples of those what fine-tuned ones that you maybe you've worked with or others that you might have, you know, and, and, and the way they, some of the best practices that they come up with for those organizational structures? I'm thinking of companies like GitLab and companies centered around open source um, and, and nonprofits, obviously. Can you get uh, some best practices yeah. we can take away? No, oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, 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 Frederick Laloux's book is really, really good. If you've read that, um, I would recommend that one, Reinventing Organizations. Um, but he gives a wide range of companies um, like some are in manufacturing and some are in oh, the, the tomato canning examples in there. Um, and, and then healthcare, uh, it's some, what generally what they, what, the, what works is just making the group smaller um, and having a really strong purpose. Because if people know what the purpose is, they can make their own choices. Um, but that's generally the problem. Why you have to have such strong hierarchy is because people don't share the purpose. They just want a paycheck. So I don't know, ultimately, I guess that goes back to a bigger problem, which is like ownership or um, just even our, the whole structure. 
uh, that's a, that's a bigger problem than I <laughs> I can take on today. Co-ops, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. going to open the floor to anyone else who we may not have heard from yet. If you want to ask something, now's kind of your chance. I'll give you a minute. How would you say the best way to kind of recreate that purpose is so that everyone contributing to this ecosystem can have those efficiencies in that moment of experimentation? all together without kind of losing both sides of it. Cause I know you said that usually you see more of the like hierarchical structures and less of the experimental part of it. I think that um, Aaron and I are actually part of a company that might be the opposite of that a bit. And we're kind mm. of looking for this next, like how we're in a really important stage of our growth and how we can bring all of these concepts back to our team to kind of create some more efficiencies that are rooted in purpose mm -hmm. without that hierarchical system really there. Okay, right. You're needing more structure now, um, but um, you don't want the, the, you don't want to go for the, the traditional. Exactly. Person. Yeah. You want to stay exper experimental. I mean, and that's really the challenge is like, how do you keep that um, diversification and individuality and autonomy while, um, integrating and growing you know how do you keep your integrity while you grow i guess is the is the question um i have a, a framework i use for that of uh it's a hexad um that you know we take people through um i mean i have a series of things i do um where because what i find is that organizations generally jump to the um the instrument how they're going to do it uh, they generally jump right to that, um, but really they need to spend a lot of time on going, well, what is what is our essence? What is our deepest essence here? And who is the, what is the deepest essence of the clients that we're trying to reach? And what are they trying to do? And so um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that purpose. And like you're saying, you want to have purpose be more self-organized and grassroots, I think, in your organization just because you want to have everyone share it. Um, and so you do need to go through some kind of process um, for that, of soliciting what, what's coming up. And there's a, there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, one thing you might look at is pro-social, um, which uh, is, a, is a process for managing uh, common resources. Um, in, in groups. And so you can, and it has a, a digital component with it so that you can be soliciting that kind of stuff from your um, workers so it can grow um, organically in that way, but that people aren't put at risk personally in putting those things out because it's pretty, it's pretty anonymous. Um, but it also works with the nested systems and it gets you aligned in that. So that's a, um, a nice framework. I'm not totally happy with it yet because it's early days. Um, but I, I, my plan is to integrate the pro-social with what we're doing so that it'll all flow seamlessly. Um, but the, I, I mean, I, if you're interested, I have a variety of frameworks and processes I take people through. So, um, and we'll be offering regenerative design workshops and even ongoing groups um, where we'll support people with this, exactly this kind of stuff. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can um, just sign up on my website and we'll, we'll let you know when that happens, uh, which is um, Team Innovation Group with two E's. Yeah, I was just going to ask as we, we close up on the hour here, um, how can people follow you, Dr. Tamsin? In the, oh, in yeah. The build? Um, yeah, well, definitely go to uh, teaminnovationgroup.com and get your name on the mailing list so I can keep you updated on all this stuff. And then, um, like I say, we're going to be launching, the, well, I got a new book coming out, um, but I also am going to be launching some regenerative design ongoing groups. groups. Um, and then you're always welcome to come out to the Borrego Institute for Living Design or to Panama. Um, we do creative residencies, we do immersions, workshops, all that stuff. 
So yeah, just sign up and you're on the mailing list and you can get, stay uh, informed in all this. And we'd love to have you. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Dr. Jansen. This has been so cool. Yeah, what a pleasure. Uh, yes, ProSocial does have a digital tool, but I don't know what the URL is. Um, but it's prosocial.world is their site. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. <laughs>